Hollywood. To many, the name is synonymous with excitement, with famous actors, with flashing lights, red carpets and limousines. It epitomizes the glitz and the glamour of this world. For others, the name is tantamount to a modern day Sodom. One famous song even calls it Gomorrah by the sea. But whatever the case, it's undeniable that something wonderful is happening in Hollywood. We're once again seeing faith-based, wholesome, remember that word? Movies being produced in Tinseltown. It was Mel Gibson's 2004 movie, The Passion of the Christ, that did it. Few would argue with that. The movie cracked open a door of a very dark room in the entertainment industry. Over $600 million at the box office was a loud doorbell that sounded like the ring of a cash register in Hollywood's ears. It was a wake-up call that showed them that America was not antagonistic toward the things of God. In fact, according to an Associated Press poll that came out around the time of the Passion, an incredible 87% of Americans wanted under God kept in the Pledge of Allegiance. Also, the New York Times reported, as the overwhelming success of the Passion of the Christ reverberates through Hollywood, producers and studio execs are asking themselves whether the movie industry has been neglecting large segments of the American audience. So hold on while we look closely at this small town that has such a big influence over this entire world in this episode of The Way of the Master. Are you a good person? Have you ever lied? What happens after someone dies? Never stolen anything? Trust in Christ. Not too many people know the history of this famous town called Hollywood. Even fewer know about an interesting offer that was made to its settlers. In 1887, a Kansas real estate tycoon named Horace Wilcox began mapping out an area especially built for Midwesterners who were tired of ice and snow. The town banned saloons and offered free land to any church that settled there. Can you believe that? Free land was offered to any church willing to settle in Hollywood? I mean, it's not much of an exaggeration to say that these days it seems like Hollywood would offer free land to any Christian willing to move out of the town. I mean, most people would agree Hollywood is not exactly the Bible Belt. Here's an interesting story. When a 19-year-old Canadian named Jim Carrey first arrived here, he said he was shocked. It was very traumatic, he said. I spent the first night in a seedy motel on Sunset Boulevard. He was reading the late great planet Earth, and it had a biblical reference that he wasn't familiar with, and since his room didn't contain a Bible, he asked the manager for one. He said, excuse me, sir, there's no Bible in my room. And the manager said, son, there isn't an entire Bible in all of Hollywood. As soon as movies began around the year 1900, even though they were without sound, they were filled with sex and violence. Then in 1921, there was a public outcry when, among other things, a well-known actor was accused of rape and murder. A director was found murdered, and another actor died of a drug overdose. Hollywood was getting a bad image, so some studio heads hired a Presbyterian senator William Hayes to try and clean up Hollywood and convince the nation that it wasn't all bad. Hayes persuaded the studios that abiding by a set moral standard was the safest and cheapest way to fix their troubles. If the industry would simply police itself, then government censorship wouldn't need to step in. Plus, the Hayes Code was a big money saver. Instead of paying to fix moral content after a film was done, the studios could simply follow the moral code before making the movie and everyone would be happy. So in 1930, Hayes Code was adopted and it stated, pointed profanity. This includes the words God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, unless used reverently, damn, hell, or every other profane or vulgar expression 
however used, is forbidden. Then in 1934, the code was enforced. It had the authority to review all movies and demand script changes. If a theater ran a film without the proper seal of approval, it would be fined $25,000. The code had successfully forced studios to toe the line. Consequently, Hollywood began producing those wonderful, award-winning, heartwarming family movies such as Ben-Hur, A Tale of Christ, The Ten Commandments, It's a Wonderful Life, and many others. However, Hollywood knew that there was big money in sex and violence. So during the 50s, some found a way around the Hayes Code through the free speech clause of the First Amendment, and studios began to push the moral envelope. In 1968, Hollywood officially abandoned the Hayes Code for filmmakers and shifted the moral responsibility to the parents with what we now have as the ratings system. The floodgates were suddenly open, and today's movies have literally no moral boundaries at all. Hollywood can make anything it wants. The majority of our movies are filled with unspeakable violence, horrible blasphemy, and graphic sex. But remember that poll? 87% of Americans want under God kept in the Pledge of Allegiance. We know that G-rated movies make nearly 11 times more money than R-rated films. Studies show 80% of adults in America want more family-friendly TV. Peter, there's a statistic that says that 80% of Americans would like to see more family-friendly content come out of Hollywood. Would you agree with that and why? Uh, yes, I think they'd like to see more family movies. I would agree to that. Yes, I would like to see more family-friendly content coming out of Hollywood. Yeah, I think it could be more family content stuff coming up. Definitely, I think it could be more. I would love to see more family-friendly uh, contact movies. Yes, definitely, definitely. There's a certain spirituality that's acceptable to Hollywood. It's non-judgmental, isn't exclusive, and doesn't mention a holy God, sin, judgment day, or warn of a place called hell. In other words, in an industry where tolerance is the motto, mainstream Hollywood will tolerate anything but biblical Christianity. You know, I got a story. Once in an episode of Growing Pains, I was asked to sleep with a girl, wake up in bed the next morning, roll over and say, Hey, babe, what was your name again? Well, I had asked the producers if we could change that scene to something more appropriate for a family audience, and that's when all the trouble started. Suddenly, I became a religious fanatic and a troublemaker. I remember another time I was having lunch with a writer in a very Jewish restaurant, and he looked at me and said, Well, Kirk, you're a Christian. You sure picked the one religion in Hollywood that's unacceptable, didn't you? Since God is the God of everything, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And since God is the consummate artist, we see that in his creative genius, in the beauty uh, of creation, of a sunset, and of a mountain range, and stars at night, and on and on and on, then uh, uh, God is in the arts. He's in the, the, that which reflects his beauty. So therefore, we should use the media and the arts to reflect the beauty of God over and against the evil of men. So uh, while we in many facets of the media uh, tout uh, uh, what men do and what men can do, we ought to give it against the backdrop of who God is and what God can do, therefore making the arts redemptive in nature and not just entertaining in nature. So Christians need to enter this field so that we can show that you can produce quality films, quality TV programs, quality radio broadcasts to reflect uh, the skill or, or music or whatever it happens to be, but in a way that seeks to redeem men and not merely entertain them.